Paula, Tara, I see you, Tom, all of you. We're going to invite you to come on over. There's still some space, there's still some seats here in the front. Um, and we're going to start our uh, formal program, the formal pitch, the reason why everyone came. So come on over. We're friendly. There's air conditioning on, so don't worry, we even have three lovely uh, front row seats here.
donors and sponsors who have really been helping us. It takes mentors, 30 or 40 mentors, and many of them in, in, the, in the room here. It, 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 it takes the students who applied, a couple hundred students who applied, and we have, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 who have come through the program, and uh, all of the other colleagues. It's a lot of people, as you can see. So, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you and also hearing what we have tonight. So let me introduce Scott Rosenzweig, who makes all this happen, along with Tony Monty. And uh, Galad is the executive director of the program. Um, just a few kind of notes on what we're going to do tonight. 
after this little spiel that I'm gonna have, we're gonna jump straight into the teams. We're gonna, you're gonna hear from all 10 teams in a randomized order generated through some app called Galat's Fingers or something like that. I don't even know, but um, you're gonna hear from all 10 teams who will give you a pitch. Not only tell you about what they're doing, but what they're looking for. So um, for people who are interested in mentorship, investors, friends, family, people who you know may actually provide support in different ways, working in the community and such, you know, we do look forward to your feedback uh, and also uh, the opportunities to work with the team. Not only are we asking that of you as our uh, gracious guests, you have in your hands, quite literally, because we cannot pry your phones away from you, using that little device in your pocket at the end of tonight, much like a reality show, you will have the power to award up to $5,000 to a team, $10,000 in total tonight. The power is fully yours. So I say that to encourage you not only to stay attentive to ask questions, to meet our teams uh, throughout the night, but also to stick around, because we're not going to tell you how to do that until the end of the night. In addition to that, we also encourage you to snap, insta, tweet, Facebook, give all your data to the company formerly known as Cambridge Analytica, through the hashtag <laughs> DesignX2018. If you're not the real-time tweeting, Instagramming, Facebooking, Insta stories, all of that type, uh, don't worry. Uh, feel free to follow us at MIT Design X on all of those various media, with the exception of Snapchat, because Glad I think is too old to use Snapchat, and I think Snapchat's dying anyway. The valuation just dropped again. <laughs> so, in any case, but also if you do want to recap, uh, out of transparency, we are streaming to Facebook Live, so if you did miss something, feel free to catch up. Um, we will have an archive there, or you could wave to your aunt or uncle who just happened to click on the wrong link on Facebook. So with that, again, hashtag uh, DesignX2018. Uh, just as a note to our teams, uh, we're gonna try to keep it tight today. So you know the order, the audience doesn't, but if you're about to come up with your next one, you ask that you kind of slowly move through the crowd near the front, um, so that we can kind of help with the transitions. But with that, I'm gonna introduce our first team, Team Spacious. <laughs> Landlords is out on revenue 
and they lose out on the cost of maintenance and upkeep, and finally they lose out on the community goodwill. And so by transforming these vacant storefronts into shared artist studio, we give artists space to work in the heart of the city, we return local character to neighborhoods, and we act as a hassle-free solution for landlords to bridge between tenants. So how do we actually obtain space? We sign short-term license contracts with progressive retail landlords who see how spaces fits into, maintains, and elevates the brand of their real estate portfolio during times of transition. While landlords are searching for tenants, negotiating contracts, and acquiring permits, we ensure that their properties are exciting destinations. Our interior designs are minimal and low cost, allowing us to easily move from site to site as they become available. We spent the last few months designing, building, and testing out a suite of this flexible furniture that responds directly to artists' needs and can easily be moved from site to site. We launched in the past few weeks at Manual Hall Marketplace with a series of exciting events, exhibitions, and installations. Over the course of five events, we drew over 700 people, including major Boston influencers. In addition to foot traffic, we've been tracking metrics such as inbound interest in the space, social media impressions, and changes in the way that people are talking about Faneuil Hall. We generate revenue through a subscription model. Artists pay us membership fees that correspond to how much time they actually need a place to work. This responds to their varied lifestyles. In addition to that, we offer community memberships for artists and neighbors who are interested in attending our events but may not need a place to work. And finally, we incorporate a gallery model where an artist receives 90% of sales, creating wealth for our members and ensuring membership retention. We've already pre-sold memberships for the summer, and people are already asking us about our plans for expansion and our plans beyond Boston. This lets us know that the market for spaces is much larger than a single pop-up at Faneuil Hall Marketplace. So our beachhead market is 10% of the 4.8 million super creative core of the creative class. And with the New York Times proclaiming that pottery is the new Pilates, and the National Endowment of the Arts stating that more and more millennials and post-millennials are integrating art into their daily life, we know our target market is growing. And so to respond to this growing demand, we offer two products. The first is this pop-up that we've been describing, our minimal viable product, which allows us to enter into a city and see if there's demand for spaces. If there is, we will establish a flagship location, a more permanent, larger workspace for our members. And these two products support each other, and they together help us realize the vision of keeping cities creative. The flagship offers both co-working as well as artist studios, as well as collective exhibition, retail, and event space. The, flag the flagship absorbs any instability of the real estate market, meanwhile the pop-up acts as a platform for our members to showcase their work, acting as both amenity and marketing device. We will be fundraising for the flagship this fall. And within five years, Spaces will operate as a network of both permanent and pop-up locations, simultaneously fostering local arts while opening up opportunities for cross-city collaboration, exposure, and access. Breaking even within a year, Spaces is a sustainable and scalable solution to keeping cities creative. And to support this vision, we have established relationships with over 100 local nonprofits, galleries, institutions, landlords, Brokers, among others. We have also been supported by the MIT startup ecosystem like DesignX, as, and we will be accelerated by Delta B this summer. We have also formed strategic partnerships with the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, who believe that spaces will keep cities creative, and we hope you'll join us. Thank you so much for having to take the Yeah. 
or opportunity or economics in relation to either value to a civic or value to a corporate entity. Sorry, but you can state that. <laughs> Great product. <laughs>
a centerpiece of the mixed use development of offices, labs, and rental housing known as the University Park, which is owned by MIT but managed by a private real estate investment trust. University Park is in a Cambridge Port. We are now housing the MIT Museum. Head inside and you'll find exhibitions covering a wide range of STEM-based topics. <laughs> you might even catch an MIT student demonstrating a project they're working on. Be sure to save time to shop in their popular store. As we move down Vassar Street towards Kendall Square, the bus will pass to a distinct but controversial Stata Center, a famous and unconventional building by the star architect Frank Gehry. The building has received mixed reviews and prompted a lawsuit from MIT over an inadequate design of the <laughs> so, and the ground floor of the building offers a cafeteria and several small free exhibits on MIT history. The MIT List Visual Arts Center is a creative laboratory. Established in 1950, the list presents a dynamic program of modern art that supports emerging artists who freely experiment and push boundaries. Shortly past the list, the bus will also pass the legendary Media Lab. Look for the huge glass walls. Both feature art and history galleries that are open to the public during business hours. The Media Lab also offers a stunning glass elevator ride for free. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we are like, um, we have a really cool team. This is half of our team, the core of it. Um, I put a bunch of cool keywords up there. You can read them yourselves. We were a little bit late, so I have to run through it. But that's Scott right there, tall guy. That's Andrew. Um, he's our developer. Candy's over here, and I'm David. Um, and we are like below these four are an amazing content creation team. What you just saw was light in action. I'm glad you guys got a chance to use it. You guys all have a chance to use it today as well. Essentially what it does is you get on any single bus here in Boston and it gives you a tour of the city. You just heard a tour of MIT. Now, why are we doing this? Really a lot of the things that we learn about transportation these days are very mechanical. Um, it's, you know, how do you get a place faster? How do you get to a place cheaper? Maybe a little more safe? Um, the way we think about moving around the city is in terms of transportation. At a light, we think that's sort of turned upside down on its head. We think mobility is human. The way we move around as humans, that's something innately that hasn't really guided the way that we have evolved as a species. Um, and it's full of meaning. The experience of mobility is something that we should value inherently in itself. So rather than sort of tuning out our mobility experiences, whether we're on, we're on the T, whether we're walking, whether we're taking a bus, whether we're driving in traffic, we do think that there's something valuable in your mobile experience. So we took that idea, that little nugget, that thing that uh, ties us together, and we, we started thinking about, well, what mobility experience right now are you engaged in, that you really enjoy doing? Um, and there's one right here in Boston. The trolley tour. It goes around the city um, and it basically does this little tour in Vanuel Hall. We just mentioned it will take you to Vanuel Hall. It will take you to Fenway Park. Um, that's pretty much it. We'll also go to Harvard. Um, and that's pretty much all you'll see. That's the route. This is Boston. That's the route that that trolley tour takes. Now, really, I think that's pretty cool. People are really engaged in the city, but we thought we could take it a step farther and do it much more cheaply. After adding in the light, every single MBTA route has become a tour. Um, and that's a lot more options. And all of a sudden, we're going to not just the big tourist traps, but we're going to places like East Boston, we're going to places all throughout Cambridge, we're making friends with people um, in Watertown and all over the place. And so all of a sudden, Boston doesn't just become this sort of tourist trap of one or two places, it becomes this whole big place that you can explore mobile. So what have we done in Design X and just about four months. Um, I'm really, really proud to say that this team right here, we've launched an app on Google Play, um, and we're about to launch it next week on the App Store. That alone is a really big accomplishment, so I think you should clap for us. <laughs> what that, what that gives, gives us access to is the 400,000 people riding the bus every single day. They're riding the bus, they want to figure out something to do, um, and this app is a great way to do that. And we're encouraging them to create user-generated content stories about their local communities, their local businesses, and different things that happen on different bus routes so that they can share with other riders, and that hopefully more people find interest in riding the bus. They're, they're tuning into the bus, not tuning out. 
Now, one of the ways that um, we are uh, beginning to test and what we're hoping to see in the study, um, or in this sort of minimum viable product that we put out there in Boston, is that one of the things that we understand is that with audio content, it engages you more in the things that you see. Um, one example of that is, does, does anybody know the correct pronunciation of Mailkin? Anybody? <laughs> A oh, mail ship, I heard it. A lot of you guys know that. Probably because you heard a podcast, is my guess. MailChimp has a podcast campaign. Everybody knows about MailChimp because the conversion rates or the advertising through audio actually engages you much more. And that's what we're doing um, with a lot of different stores and organizations along these routes. Flower Baby here being one, is that we're informing people about flower. Now, that conversion rate's really good. The other thing we're doing is it's location-based. As soon as you get close to Flower Bakery, you're going to learn about Flower Bakery. Now for Flower, that's great. They have 6,000 people walking up and down Mass Ave right now, but all of a sudden the 13,000 people on the number one bus that goes by become part of their foot traffic, and people are more aware of Flower Bakery. So that's what we think the value of this engaging people in their mobile experience can be from a business aspect. How are we really going to run that as a, as a business when we're combining audio and location together? Um, what we're calling this at a light is a new kind of AI audio reality. And in many ways, I think that could be superior to visual augmented reality. Um, because it does engage you and it allows you to experience your environment in a very interactive type way. Now, we have many different directions actually that we're considering at the moment, to being completely upfront with you. All of these could be very revenue driving um, directions. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of what they might be. But things, ooh, looks like a little bit off on the text, but things like cities, especially smaller cities with transit systems, um, things like Charleston, historic towns where there's lots of tourists coming in and they want to get the tourists on those buses. Or PSAs, now that everybody's tuning out um, and listening to their music, they actually miss all that MBTA's announcements. They don't know when the red line's canceled because they're listening to something else. We're also thinking of different synergies with hardware companies, software companies, and also content, things like podcasts. So how could your podcast be location specific? Um, and then finally, institutional. So you just saw how MIT could really begin to harness a lot of the interest they have from all kinds of different groups that come and visit that MIT is actually not ready to account for. You can see throngs of Chinese and Japanese tourists that are outside 77 Mass Ave, which is exactly where they just got on the bus. Um, and we've actually been marketing to them as well. Looking ahead, Design Next has been an exceptionally wonderful experience for all of us. Um, we've done a lot in that small amount of time. Looking ahead is really we're looking to build out partnerships where this idea of audio reality can become reality um, with the park. Um, we do think that eventually this would be a user-generated platform where people can create audio along not just bus routes, but all kinds of different mobile routes. So that's us. We're like, I think you'll love the view from the bus. Thank you. certain um, points of interest and you can flag others. 
So if enough people knew it to be false, I think the flags would, would weed it out and like it, uh, we'd have an algorithm that just um, compares likes and flags and bring the most accurate to the top. Because it's like pretty user generated. So a lot of time this kind of content will be pr pretty personal. You can hear those personal stories that you can find on Wikipedia. It's not kind of like everyone knows that information. I think that's also some content which would make the lives become more personal and more much more interesting. Hi, a very interesting application. I think it's very exciting that you guys are activating the existing transportation infrastructure uh, to create a new tour program. Um, one thing that I've seen that's happening with new apps is that there is a drive to respond to accessibility. How are you thinking about or preparing for your hard of hearing or deaf customers who might be interested in inter interacting with this app, but who can't actually hear what the content is? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question. We've had a lot of discussion about the different mo uh, forms of media um, that we're working with. Um, I think the most direct response to your question is that we, from based off of our user testing, um, we are very clear that we want to have a transcript or a textual part. So you could sort of see it in the video, but there's actually a button where you can click, flips over, and it will give you the, um, the, what, uh, the explanation. Um, that's one aspect. I think the other one that we're working with, too, is uh, content creation. So as I mentioned, this is user generated. Um, and that's one where, to be honest, we're, we're always wrestling. How do we get people to make really intriguing, great, very well narrated um, media um, and make it easy for them? And that's one we're, we're definitely still wrestling with. But we're making, at the moment, what we're doing is we're making an option. You have a photo, you have text, and you have uh, and audio, and then you also have a geotag so that you know those are really easy for them. Um, really what I think what we're doing is we're, we're bringing media and we're bringing the geotag together so that people can explore in a very different way and be excited about moving around the city. Great, thank you so much to my life. It is on the Google Play Store. I've got it right there on my screen. So uh, feel free to download it. I think the MIT Wi-Fi is great enough where everyone on Android, all 12 of us, seven of us can download it right now. <laughs> uh, um, you know, with that, uh, you know, our phones are personal. Uh, so now we're going to talk about a team that's looking at something even more personal than your personal device or your personal narratives on a bus. Uh, team Skin Pixel. <laughs> Something that reports constantly. We need something that reports constantly. We 
need something that's cheap, and you need something that's important. So after thinking about this for some time, we realized that the solution was literally under our toes. It's your skin. Cells like the ones in your skin are built to sense the molecular supernova. On top of that, they're trivially portable, they're easy to access and inspect, they respond rapidly to physiological, concentrate, to physiological changes, and that's part of what already has them. The only problem is that skin cells have no way of telling, of telling you what they know. We want to give them that voice. We're going to use recent advances in genetic technology to make your cells change color when they have something to tell you. That looks something like this. A patient will submit a skin biopsy and to us, and we will have the genetic logic that allows the cells to change color when a certain analyte concentration threshold exceeds a certain value. So if your glucose goes above 100, a certain patch of your skin, predefined, will flip this color. That way, patients will know at a glance what's going on inside their own bodies to be able to take action. All right, so as Nick mentioned earlier, this is a huge market and a huge opportunity as well. In the United States, 30 million people have a diabetic condition. That's about 10% of the population. Up to a third of the population has a pre-diabetic condition. Now, an NIH study from last year found that up to 48% of diabetic patients do not regularly comply with the necessary glucose testing that they have to perform daily for the reasons mentioned above. We believe, according to our own numbers, that we could save up to $11,000 per patient by switching them to this genetic encoding system. Now, what are the advantages that we can bring to the table? Well, there's four major things. The first is that there's no calibration of the system at all. It's genetically coded into your cells. It's uh, able to sense the molecular concentrations in real time. And you get direct bloodline sampling. So there's no calibration, and there, there's no need for changing the system once it's already in place. Secondly, you have real-time monitoring. This is something that's not offered in most glucose testing today. And not just for glucose, but for other analytes as well. This is a modular system, so it allows new components to be added onto the existing platform once they come available. Thirdly, there's no routine blood drops. Imagine that, there's no blood testing whatsoever, and no more needles. Um, we believe that this will drastically increase patient compliance, as they'll be able to look at their skin at a glance and be able to tell their physiological state. And fourthly, we can uh, make the claim that it's about 50% more affordable than the current options in the market right now. So what does our business model look like? Well, the diabetes market is about $10.7 billion. And uh, we believe that once the system goes online, within the first five years, we'll have about $8.5 million to go. So our monetization plan looks something like this. We're going to start with glucose, as we've mentioned, because it's our reach head market and it's the most obvious first application of this technology. But then, after spending about two years developing this app, we will start to expand this app to other blood lines as well. Imagine having a full blood panel on your arm at all times. Have that information communicated to your doctors so you can better diagnose disease early. But we're going to get even more ambitious than that, because after this point, we're going to discover things that blood testing can't even pick up right now. When you remove blood from the body, what happens is that many of the biomolecules in that molecular zoom begin to degrade really quickly. And so you can't actually test for them once you take them out of the body. But once they're in the body, you have much more flexibility in the type of testing that you want to do. So in the years after that, we will move towards novel diagnostics. So in terms of where we are right now, um, we were fortunate enough to get $15,000 from Design and uh, $20,000 from the Sandbox Innovation Fund through my team. Um, we believe, according to our calculations, this will get us through our cell culture trials. We also additionally have a biomaker space that we're currently using in the Kendall area to conduct this, these experiments. Um, once this happens, we'll move into animal models. So it allows to test this technology uh, within animals and to be able to do experiments with the delivery design of the actual skin patches. And after that point, we'll move into human trials and actually start using this in patients uh, to do real-time monitoring. I think around the time that the cell culture experiments wrap up will be uh, when we'll start to seriously look at long-term funding once we have some data to go off of. But certainly we're interested in starting conversations early and you know, building partners throughout this whole process. So um, you know, Nick and I are the team of SkinPixel, and we bring to the table an immense amount of technical and entrepreneurial expertise. So my background is, is in chemical engineering and bioengineering. 
Um, I helped to spin out another company out of the MIT Media Lab, uh, and have just recently, you know, come back from that to help uh, push this forward. And Nick will tell you a little bit about his background. Um, my background is also working a little bit in biotech startups. I'm currently a graduate student here at MIT, where I work on something that uh, is, is a little bit different. Uh, I, I work on developing uh, technologies for doing neuroscience that are harder, stronger, faster. Um, and I also have some background in data science. And um, so that's SkinPixel. We're excited to talk to everyone here and um, you know, hope to get the conversation started. Thank you very much. Built is being built for the extremely wealthy 
it's being built as assets and completely being driven by the pure concept of profit. This prioritizes large lots, economies of scale, and builds these massive structures that, let's be honest, no one wants to really live there. So, for all of Josh and I, we believe that to build it, it's, we can build better quality homes without it needing to cost more. It simply takes rethinking the system for how to make them come to life. So, the question is how do we do that? And there's a model that uh, is starting to crop up in other parts of the world that hasn't made its way to the U.S. yet that we are very inspired by. Uh, this is a 24-unit multifamily building, the cafe on the ground floor, built in Melbourne three years ago uh, by a company called Nightingale. And what's interesting about this is that the units were valued at 750000 but they were sold for 600000 so 20% below market. The other thing that's interesting is that all of the people who purchased the units agreed to a covenant that they couldn't resell their units for profit. They could sell them at the same price they bought them for with an adjustment for the increasing property values. So they'll remain at 20% below market for the entirety of their lifetime. So how did they create these units at a below market value? Uh, there's three important tenets to the model that they employed that we're looking to replicate. One is that they capped their own profits. So as a development entity, that means that no matter what happens with the project, we won't take more than 15% of the total construction costs. It also means that people who invest in the project agree to the same terms. The units on this project were all pre-sold. This makes it more of a co-development process, so there's more communication with the people living in the units, and they get to have a say in, the, in certain decisions that are made during the design process. Um, and lastly, there's full transparency, so you know if you're buying a unit exactly where your money is going. And as mentioned, you get to, you get to weigh in on certain decisions that developers are normally having to guess around. So, for example, with this project, they asked, they asked the buyers whether or not they wanted a second bathroom in their unit. If they did, it would cost them an extra $30,000. All of them decided that they were fine without it. The same was true for a parking space for an individual washer in their unit. So they're able to create something more customizable, and each of these decisions, the savings that are generated, go to the future, the future owners of the unit. And they had such success with this project that they now have a 3,000 person waiting list for any unit that comes online. People on the waiting list are putting in 10% deposits before a site is even selected. And they've used that waiting list to create a $300 million equity fund to help finance lower income tenants uh, to, be able to be a part of the model. Recognize that translating this model to the U.S. means hitting a whole lot of legal and regulatory realities, which um, is a crazy feat to overcome, but it's something that, to be quite honest, we're extremely excited about. We're nerdy planners, if you didn't hear that earlier. Um, but so in addition to the Nightingale model, we have two features that we're adding. The first is, once again, going back to our planning roots, our interest in partnering with cities. And this comes towards being able to better navigate the regulatory systems, but then also being able to being able to get better advantage of the incentives that cities are able to offer developers. The second is co-housing, and by co-housing we mean a focus on shared amenities and the ability for people to live more in community than they do currently. So, how many of you have once dreamed of living close to your friends and raising your kids in the same neighborhood? Uh, well, we're trying to make that possible, and with our model, you'll have the opportunity to, as a pre-buyer, to decide what sort of communal amenities that you want to include. Um, an example of this is a co-housing community that was built in Seattle two years ago, and they have a courtyard where kids can play. They also have a communal dining room, so everyone in the apartment building can have meals together, which they do every other day. They take turns cooking, so once a month. Um, for each unit, and then they also have a communal guest room which anyone can check out. And the idea with our model is that the group of buyers can customize how they want to use their communal spaces and how much, to what degree they want to be part of uh, a close-knit community or, or so. So there's many ways of interacting with them, with the model. So over this next year, Josh and I are still going to be pursuing our master's programs. And so it's an opportunity for us to just further develop this model and uh, test our assumptions and find out the realities of if what we're saying. We are looking to pilot our first project locally. We're also open to uh, working in cities that are, have a similar housing crisis. 
um, particularly cities on the West Coast. We are interested in focusing our target audience for our first project for people that have more capital available to be able to put down a 10 to 20 percent deposit on a unit that will not be available. They'll move into it two to three years later. And then from the success of this first project, being able to build on that and have a better ability to pre-sell the units for future years and then being able to get cheaper financing from that. And I think Josh mentioned this earlier, the fund that any bill is able to create. What, what we're wanting to do is from this first project then be able to grow there and hit deeper and deeper levels of affordability. So the first project we will build this um, build this fund so that we can help finance lower and lower income and middle income people to purchase their first homes through our model. So what we're looking for now, um, if you work with the city and you're interested in creating permanently affordable housing, come talk to us. Also, if you are interested in investing in something that can help solve the housing crisis, uh, we'll be able to take investments as low as $200 through our partnerships with crowdfunding platforms. And um, you can contact and let us know as well. And then lastly, if you're interested in seeing a for all life project in your community um, and are interested in being part of a priority waitlist, then uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you.
Up until the moment when our visions become reality. This is the true change that we can make with our designs. The problem is we're not so lucky, because the decisions we're making right now are going to be there for a long time. It's not up to us to take those decisions, it's up to our clients. But clients are also important for us. For each client, equals a project. So we have clients, we serve them, and we deliver the project. But we share with our clients, whether they are developer, real estate developers, or contractors, construction industry, we share with one thing. Time equals money for us. Problem is, This one, we have limitations from site topography. But even in the middle of the city, we have some limitations from surrounding building contexts. This moment is where capturing the right data will make a difference for us. So, these guys have been doing this job for the past few hundred years. They are surveyors. So, they have been using very old technology that hasn't changed much over the past few hundred years, which is a tripod. And the consequences for this, we have more time spent in site work, and we also have a lot of money wasted for the cost of rework. Numbers say that we could save about $33 billion each year if we only could capture the right data. So why think, that's a very, very hard problem like this. So we're living in a digital age right now. This image actually came today from the Times. So the drone age is coming, definitely. And aerial intelligence is becoming to gain a huge interest in academia, industry, development, everything. We're crazy about drones, so we decided to do our startup focusing on serving these small instruments. In Airworks, we developed a web service platform for automated aerial data analytics. Our product kits include 3D models, CAD drawings, and automated survey inspection for existing buildings. We also have a packed surface kit, including quality control for site conditions. We have volumetric analysis for site materials. We can also do 3D models for existing building and quality check. So all this is useful for the industry that can be equipped in the near future with more UAVs. Nora, this is great. I've been in construction for a lot of years now, and I know this is a hard process. Our workflow right now consists of three main steps. The first step is the data capture by UAV. The next step is the stitching of all that imagery. And the third step is really where we're useful. This is where our engineers spend a lot of time creating AutoCAD maps from ortho mosaics. Now, Norman, where can this technology help me? Well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. This is exactly what we have done in Airworks. We developed machine learning algorithms that autonomously convert aerial data, whether it's captured by satellite or in the near future more drones flying in the city. And we can produce an automated CAD drawings that are surveyed made with an accuracy tens of a foot. So, what do you think about that? I think this is great. <laughs> So right now, uh, we do have uh, some great opportunities in this market. And currently in the U.S., we have about 44,000 licensed surveyors. And the FAA estimates that by 2020, we will have 100,000 drone licenses, uh, or drone licensed uh, go out. So right now, if we're able to capture half of that and charge those people $2,000 a month for processing of that data, we have a market for about $2.4 billion. So right now, we do have people in these spaces. The first area, the second area, and now the third, which we are leading. So currently, we do have some revenue, and by the end of uh, our third year, uh, we will become profitable, and as our software is developed, you really get to see where we become more, most useful.
So right now, uh, we are spending this summer uh, in several accelerators, and so far, uh, about $65,000, I mean $65,000, and we also have uh, $2,500 reoccurring revenue per month. Uh, and then also, we have uh, about $130,000 in contract negotiations. So like I said before, uh, we've been accepted into a few accelerators that have, of course helped us uh, jumpstart this. Design X is one of them, and this summer we'll be in Delta V. So we have a killer uh, team that we're working with, ranging from aerospace engineering, construction, architecture, GIS, uh, software engineering, and uh, business development. And this year we've been able to work with our uh, great mentors who have helped us through this journey. And I want to give a big shout out to our mega minds here at DesignX. Thank you guys very much. Inspired to be MIT because 
because you couldn't find people who could do the survey anymore. So if somehow you were 100 and, you know, 200 years old, to actually be able to see a company doing basically what he was trying to solve, I think he would be shocked. Also, he'd be scared by all these screens and devices in our pockets, because he would have no idea what those are. Uh, so going from surveying to how we actually think about investments and where we create sales, I'm going to invite a review. Street level address 
to be able to tell you to buy 100 federal and to sell 300 Congress. Disclaimer, that is not actual investment advice. <laughs> so let's take a quick look at the platform as we've been developing it over the course of this semester. We've been working hard to gather a lot of the historical data that's going to be crucial to building trends once, once we've integrated in the predictive forward-looking data. And so what you can see in the map view is you can compare regions and you can filter by some of the metrics that are most important to you. Employment, population, uh, innovation, and migration trends. And in addition, whether at the regional level, the sub-market level, or even at the asset level, you can compare individual properties or cities or regions and see how the trends that are evolving are impacting each of them differently. And finally, you can drill down into the asset, uh, into the submarket and asset level where we've layered on additional data such as startup activity, uh, trends and isochromes, and future development. So we've been spending the semester refining the idea, gathering preliminary data, and building initial prototypes. We have a product roadmap for the following three quarters, and this is underpinned by our very simple subscription-based business model. To conclude, I'd like to invite you, the investors, lenders, brokers, and developers here in the room, to let us help you master your markets. We're seeking five alpha partners over the summer and the coming months, and I look forward to responding to your emails personally. Thanks very much. I'm Michael Pierce of Radio Analytics. And we're 
working together to build access to a dignified life. This map over here shows a population living in settlements not normally recognized by cities. Because of this specific type of development, these communities have grown without access to basic infrastructure. These large amounts of money reflect the scale, the challenge, and the urgency of bringing infrastructure to these parts of the world. Rapid growth in these cities have left millions living on the periphery. This means governments of developing countries have been unable to meet the demand of its rural population, resulting in deteriorating living conditions with little to no access to basic services. I want to draw your attention to the district of San Fatima Flores in Lima, Peru. Many of these homes lack access to one of five essential services, such as water, electricity, sanitation, education, and health. This boy here misses school because he has to walk miles every day to buy water from a water truck and carry buckets up the hills to his house. And because of the situation, private companies and organizations are the ones that are <coughs> starting to implement off-grid services. For instance, Raul from XRunner is bringing water to the toilets. Paul at Our Mundo is bringing off-grid solar panels to these communities. And Sima, an organization which is collecting kitchen waste to create compost to start agriculture in these very arid landscapes. Informal markets are extremely volatile and they change rapidly. The pace at what these, at what these places change is just too fast for organizations, small organizations like all our moon or extraordinary to keep track of their needs without knowing what the conditions are right now. They're operating blind. So what's keeping extraordinary and our mundo and all these guys from helping thousands more people? What Raul and Paul told us is that what they ultimately need is spatial and demographic information of these settlements. But unfortunately, the world sees a map like this. This is what governments and infrastructure providers see. Built on an idealized condition of growth. In white, you see the city blocks drawn as, as they were expected the city to grow. For example, in Boston. It looks like Boston in a way, but. Um, in reality, Lima has grown in ways that were unprecedented. This city, as others around the world, are much more intricate and complex than what the government and the world expect. Each red dot, red dot represents households that occupy this incredible terrain, forming a complex spatial ecosystem that is rapidly changing and evolving. These are the conditions viewed through health residents. We just formalized this, this map for machine learning algorithms, and this is information that has never existed before. This map, not even the government has it, it does not exist in Google Map. And, and we think that with this piece of information and a lot of others, we believe that the synthesis of this will help Raul and Paul not reach just 3,000 people, but the 40,000 people we see in red. And we do this by putting people on the map, identifying where people are, and identifying what services it is that they need. And we identify where and who are the people that can help them provide these services. And we connect the dots. So our platform provides Raul a system into which he can identify the location of current users and potential users. It also provides information of where they can grow, which roads are too steep for trucks to reach for the delivery system. Not only density, but where people are willing to pay in their limited budget. <laughs> Finally, we help them track their impact to see how their actions are supporting, for example, human development goals, such as birth mortality, nutrition, school attendance rates. <coughs> and why does Raul care about these things, and these organizations care about these things? Is that they care about these things because they align with their mission and ultimately it helps them to raise more money. So through CalSci, through it's data that is accessible, affordable and easy to read. We want to start democratizing data and turn information from being a noun to a verb. This is the kind of information that organizations like the World Bank and the UN spend decades and billions of dollars collecting. So let's take a look at what the platform looks like. So Raul from XRunner is able to log on. He 
he's able to map his customers. And this is a prototype we developed in collaboration with our partners. And when Raoul logs on, you can see who he's needing to pay, who it still needs to be distributed to, and then optimize some of his routing schedules. On top of this, he's able to do some future forecasting, some projections, to look for partners, or the private enterprises and government, we can partner with for future funding and financing. So, CalSci offers four different tiers of subscription. And ideally, we see this as offering solutions to different, cast, uh, different cost options. And this really hits a multiple scale of, of, of companies. So the bodega on the corner could ultimately look at a way of signing up to CalSci to serve more people in their alumni. Or the government and uh, international aid organizations who are looking for specialized data sets to understand better financing methods. So right now, our current partners are serving about 40,000 informal households. But through the CalSci platform, they could reach one to 1.2 million households who currently don't have access to one of these five infrastructure services. So CalSci built on a number of already existing tools. And it really offers a unique, a unique setup here. There's already some, some others who provide data collection, customer management, some mapping platforms, but none who really operate in this informal market sector. So really when we're looking at projections and how this works, and we're, we're dealing with sort of informal economies. And to be in a disruptive service, we really have to look for improvements or, or ways for us to have an impact. And we think that working with a small scale provider is the best way for us to collect information, collect data, and optimize our models. And we've started in Lima. We've already invested a lot of our time and finances. And fortunately, with Alexander and Sophie both being involved in that area, it's, it's given us a leg up. But it costs about $300,000 for us to expand to every new city. And as we do this, over the next three years, we're looking to expand to three new cities, um, which gives us a high volume of customer bases <laughs> and also allows us to increase our, our, our um, database of information that we're able to build on. In order to do this and to launch in 2019, we're really contacting a number of people for a, about a million dollars investment over the next three years. And this enables us at periods to invest in these different cities at the $300,000 $300, $300, benchmark that I showed you earlier. So we're a pretty unique team of architects, builders, data and social scientists with about 30 years of combined experience working in developing economies. We're going to be spending probably summer in Lima and Peru, validating a lot of our models and also contacting future customers as we launch our pilot in Lima. So, as Alexander mentioned at the start, we are a for-profit enterprise built on a social impact mission. And at the end of the day, we really see this as a human issue. We're really excited to start in Lima, but we shouldn't end there. Thanks for your time.
best way to deal with this recovery is for all the city residents to prepare. management organizations, they advocate for the use of go kits, which are kits uh, for families and individuals, but as most of you know, few people have these and even fewer people maintain them. So, in a disaster and after disaster, communities rely on a series of ad hoc infrastructure to get the critical information they need. So everything from an ad hoc notice board, uh, to a uh, power charging station for cell phone users. This is after Hurricane Sandy. So communities, buildings, networks themselves, they're super motivated to help each other out after disaster. We're trying to tap into that energy before one needs it. Hubs are a new kind of civic infrastructure designed to embed community-scale preparedness into cities. By activating public spaces with everyday useful infrastructure, the idea is that Prep Hubs become community nodes for post-disaster critical resources. Prep hubs are designed for dual use to work with both everyday and post-disaster. Everyday functions are aimed at improving the familiarity of the infrastructure so that in a disaster people already know how to use them. So in that way, every day, a pedal bar generator is a fun way to charge a cell phone. Post-disaster is an endless supply of power. A speaker is a way to hear music for the day. Post-disaster is an alert system from emergency management agencies. While a lighting system uh, activates public spaces on an everyday basis, post-disaster indicates to the local community that the prep hub is functional even in the case of a blackout. So prep hubs have a modular design where they're scaled for different community uses. A small sidewalk prep hub can integrate power and communications supplies, whereas a larger neighborhood park prep hub can involve emergency supplies as well as water infrastructure. And at scale, prep hubs become a redundant backup form of communication that connects emergency responders with city residents as well as emergency managers. So as a research project at MIT's Urban Risk Lab, we've been working on this project for about three years. We built three full-scale prototypes to test ideas and generate user feedback. And this experience has helped us build knowledge on everything from the durability of the object to user interface. And there's a lot of interesting work that's happening in the space of smart urban infrastructure. Where we think of Prep Hub as a distinct advantage is it's designed for both everyday and post-disaster use, as well as being an off-grid form of infrastructure. And we're currently partnering with the City of Portland to uh, work on two more longer-term Prep Hubs with partners of the City of Portland, Portland General Electric, and the University of Portland. So the experience with these stakeholders, as long as that, along with our uh, best in the Design X, is pushing us from having a research project that's been tested in the field into a viable, scalable business model. And we have a multidisciplinary team of architects, urban planners, software developers, and hardware developers. And with this expertise, together with the focus on how communities inter interact with public space infrastructure, we're really motivated into the next step of the project. Ultimately, what the prep hub is doing is helping communities improve the spaces that they already use. And in, at the highest of levels, how do we work together to reduce risk together? Thank you very much for your time. Disaster environment, the city could not have like power either. How do you make sure your equipment will be working even though there's some damage in this whole city electricity system also? Of course. So um, it requires a lot of redundancy built into the system, including solar backup and a series of batteries. So how the scale of that system is designed will depend on the size of an individual pepper. 
but essentially building redundancy into the system to not rely on them anymore. The cost per unit? Uh, I don't know. I think at the minute our prototypes are in the range of $35, but uh, the prototypes we developed in Portland right now are far higher um, because the process of working with the city is a longer term research project. That question was cost per unit. So thank you so much, Prep Hub. <laughs> some of the people that make Design X possible, although we have a bunch of people standing already. If you're a mentor in the house, can you stand up and just like wave? If you're one of our mentors, there's a couple in the back, over there, here in the back, thank you. If you're any of the guest lecturers through the semester, can you also stand up as well and wave? Few there, in the back there, thank you. Uh, if you time during the semester, including at pitch night. Uh, why don't you stand up and give yourselves a round of applause. That's everyone. Stand up, come on, come on, come on. Home stretch. Let's be careful. We have the rights. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I just wanted to actually recognize you. All the amazing people that have made this possible, both from the five departments uh, at the School of Architecture Planning, at the Dean's Office of the School, to all of our volunteers, mentors, supporters, funders, alumni, friends, family, everything. Thank you so much for all your help. And I'm actually going to introduce actually one of our alumni very quickly. I'm going to hand it over to Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Marsh. I'm a super proud uh, sponsor of uh, all of the things that are going on at Design X. I'm still calling it the built world because it's the world that we did not that humans built, as opposed to the world that uh, was built by other things like nature. Um, and I want to say that one of the things that is most proud for me is that the sensibility of making the world a better place, uh, which is what MIT is all about, it has no better world than here in the department and school of architecture. Uh, because we make the physical world that makes us uh, humans. And so I want to give a big shout out to all of what we do as a department of architecture, a school of urban design planning, uh, all of the departments of architecture, that, the departments of the school of MIT that make the built world around us, uh, and then also a shout out to the alumni community. It takes 10 years of our alumni community uh, from a people perspective to make one of the GSC. So we're, you know, 10, 15, 20 people a year. They're 200, 300 people a year. Uh, so we are making a community of everyone who's ever graduated from architecture or urban at MIT, and we're one community because we're building a better world around us. So I just want to give a shout out to uh, your program, which is so amazing, and all of the alumni community that support what you're trying to do here. And uh, we're here for you. Thank you. Uh, medicines and high quality food. 
Uh, indoor environments are much more productive and resilient uh, than outdoor systems. And in particular, the green rush has begun. Um, as a medicinal crop, the cannabis market is a rapidly growing industry that is currently valued at 30 billion. We have some fans over here. <laughs> uh, in the US, and it will be 60 billion by 2025. In Massachusetts alone, it's projected to be uh, uh, 1 billion by 2020. An analysis by the CIBC in Canada predicts that sales will eclipse that of spirits and even approach the wine industry. But let's meet our uh, indoor cultivators, Mary and Jake. Previously, flower growers, they now produce 6,000 pounds of medicinal cannabis per year in a 20,000 square foot greenhouse uh, to serve about 5,300 medical patients. However, there are basic significant challenges. Operational costs are high. It is difficult to achieve consistent yields. And even indoors, um, there are so many variables that affect crop quality. And in face of these challenges, it is difficult to, to remain profitable in an increasingly competitive environment. So let's see what this looks like for Mary and Jake's operations. They're spending $1 million per year on labor to inspect and maintain their crops. They're open to technology and have high-end control systems and some sensors, but the data they collect is not actionable. Um, despite their best efforts, yields can still vary by as much as 50%. Adam Eve can be their secret weapon. We enter the greenhouse with a customized sensor array. We capture visible and invisible plant characteristics in real time. And they tell us how the plant is growing and responding to the environment. And from that, we can get our data can provide actionable insights. So this is the future of indoor agriculture. So, <laughs> so our software monitors each plant over time for growth, stress, performance, as well as the conditions that it's experiencing. It provides an easy-to-use, real-time system for cultivators to immediately be notified of any signs of plant stress or disease and to take action, or when maintenance, like trimming, for example, is required, as well as tracking plant performance uh, measured against the, the benchmarks that we establish. The user gets a systems-level understanding of the energy efficiency use and the precise conditions across the entire uh, crop space. With Adam Eve's solution, Mary and Jane can free up tedious labor and prevent disease and pest outbreaks before they start. They are now able to plan ahead and feel confident in meeting rising product demand. They can leverage our insights to tailor their crop to meet the rising expectations in quality and control standardizations. Adam Eve is aiming to be a leader in this new ecosystem. We will do so by differentiating in multiple dimensions. Our software offers full data integration. We'll start with greenhouses, but our solution is scalable and adaptable to all other indoor systems. We offer a simple, turnkey solution. And beyond cannabis, our technology transfers to all other crops. So we've crunched the numbers on the cannabis market and we project that um, we can increase a cultivator's revenues by up to uh, $90 per square foot. Ultimately, we increase their revenues uh, via four cumulative fronts. Um, responding to the plant needs, we can increase the yields by up to 20%. With more consistent and higher quality, we can increase the product value by up to 10%. With we shorten the crop cycle days, therefore increase the number of crops per year. And we also decrease their expenses by saving labor, uh, utilities, and inventory. Uh, we, we will offer the software um, through a subscription fee that we have determined by uh, following a 10 to 1 rule. So that is we capture 10% of these uh, generated revenues uh, that have been uh, generated by our product. We plan to price this on a per square foot rate. So a typical 20,000 foot um, medicinal cannabis can canopy translates into about 180k uh, revenues for us per year. Our three-year projection puts us at 10 million sales in sales from three sales channels of 
from acquiring a total of 50 full subscription customers, um, in, in addition to customers through other channels of, of consulting and compliance. So myself and Ian, uh, Tom, and Mo, and Julian, who uh, is not here today, um, we, uh, we, we, we have come from diverse backgrounds and bring skills and expertise to cover all dimensions of, of the product. We've uh, acquired strong support from Microsoft AI for Earth, several MIT accelerators and incubators, and have formed strong partnerships with uh, industry experts, growers, and mentors. Over the next three to four months, we'll be running a pilot project in the greenhouse in May. By the end of the year, we want to raise 500K to allow us to scale um, and grow the team and start acquiring customers next year. We've identified additional revenue streams that ultimately we aim to move into, um, including other high value crops, other markets in other countries, um, the enormous medicinal plant market in China, and also even other types of farming systems. Uh, we're excited to announce that we'll be uh, starting a R&D operation in South Boston on June 7th. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your time, and we'd also like to thank this Design X community, our mentors, Jason, Ziad, and Meg, uh, to help us, uh, all the learning we've done, and growing, of course. <laughs> Special medicinal tomato fudge brownies for you to try that. In the meantime, any questions in the house? Here. I have some familiarity with the attempts to grow exotic mushrooms in Ontario. Uh, I can see the use for a system like this if it works, but I'm worried about the cost. I don't think it would be very cost. Your value crops. Um, you know, uh, we, we focus on high value crops, and, and one of the reasons for choosing medicinal cannabis as our beachhead was um, to give us some playroom to iterate and develop the technology. We do feel strongly that um, through those iterations, through uh, piloting in this beachhead market, that we can bring the cost uh, 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 far down. Um, and, uh, you know, Really, um, we, we, we would set those costs, I think, to the, to the crop uh, that we're working with. Um, one of our, our goals is to use very low-cost sensors, so we're not a sensor company, but our focus is on the software. Um, and, you know, we're going to China, actually, through the China Future Cities Lab this, this summer. One of our goals is to make some partnerships with sensor manufacturers. So I, I think that um, while we can't give you numbers at the moment, that think this solution could be feasible for lower value crops like, like mushrooms as well. Um, just it might take a little time. Any other questions from the house? Seeing them. Thank you so much, Team Abby. <laughs> support that we received from the MIT alumni community, but I also wanted to highlight, you know, the alums from DesignX as well. I had mentioned uh, Kim and Learning Beautiful. I also want to give out a shout out to uh, Nusha, who I think is here somewhere, uh, an alumni from Cohort 17 with BioBot or Sewer Sensing for Health uh, company. Um, they've been incredibly successful. They actually just went through Y Combinator um, out on the other coast and also just went through uh, a seed round, right? $2.5 million raised. So it's a testament to the incredible talent of the MIT at large. Um, so we're so humbled by the support that you know, we receive from you and that you know, for us, we're so happy that we can pass it on to our students. As the sun goes down, uh, we're going to transition to our last team who will uh, be a little bit more dreamful as we consider uh, what, we'll, uh, what we'll do when the sun is finally down when we end the scene. So, uh, Team Dormio.
I felt I was nowhere really in this kind of nowhere space where all of these ideas exist. And, and we've seen this over and over again in different participants. Um, however, hypnagogia is not the only place where we dream. We also dream in what is called deep sleep or REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement. The idea is in this state, your eyes are seen, such as uh, your eyes move very rapidly. Uh, dreams in this state are uh, linked to memory consolidation and improved emotional well being. So, we were really intrigued by this new sleep stage. It's not new, but by this sleep stage. And we wanted to build a device that would help us track this. So, we built a sleep, smart, uh, sleep mask, which is sensitive and flexible. Uh, it goes in your eyes and as you touch the sensor, you can see the, the signal going to the laptop. Now the idea is that you can imagine your eye being, eyeball being on that sensor, and you would see something that's very rapid, and a signal that's very spiky, and that's how we would measure REM sleep. And, and we tested it. Uh, so sleep, the sleep industry is an $80 billion industry, and devices that do sleep staging cost over $30,000. Uh, we were able to do specific sleep stage tracking, uh, hypnagogia and REM sleep, with devices that cost less than $30. Uh, we're looking for partnerships, piloting, and help in manufacturing. We had a great time at DesignX and being a part of this cohort and also building this product. Thank you very much for your time. have those nightmares in their REM state, they interrupt their REM state, but their REM state is what's really important for doing the emotional regulation that they need to be doing. So it's self-reinforcing in that way. And so if you have some sort of system that can influence people's dreams away from whatever their recurrent nightly dream is, which is, it's the same content every night, then you could use it for the treatment of these recurrent nightmares. So that's definitely one of the first ideas we came up with. Um, there uh, is a clinician, there are actually two clinicians that we've talked to and demoed our devices to. One is local, one is in Canada. Um, but since neither one of us is clinicians, um, I don't think we should speak too much on that, except that the device that we manufacture um, seems to be getting those folks excited, and we're really excited about giving it to them. I'm going to run to the Just out of curiosity, what's the advantage of the actual sensor for the eye instead of just EEG and seeing when you get to REM sleep? Cost. Um, pretty simply, um, so cost is tough, uh, having reusable electrodes is tough, putting 10, 20 gel on people is tough, having tethered EEG is tough, uh, having the sort of EMG and EOG interference that you get with the EEG is tough. Um, there's a couple different factors. The sort of really clear ones is that when somebody's eyes are moving at 10 hertz versus 1 hertz, it is super obvious versus an alpha-theta ratio that you need with EEG. Um, so the signal processing is harder. And then also just reusable sensors are annoying. And if you want to use dry electrodes, you get a bad signal. Um, so EEG is tough. Great. Thank you, Team Dormio. <laughs> So in a second, we're going to bring up a slide because as I mentioned at the beginning, you have the great responsibility to award our cash prizes. Well, cash to a novelty size check. Um, so you have the power to award uh, three prizes tonight. For our first prize, we're going to give $5,000. Our second place team will receive $3,000 and our third place team will receive uh, $2,000. How you're gonna vote is on your mobile device, you are gonna visit 
this URL, bit.ly uh, slash dx for design x pitch. And you are going to do uh, rank preference. You are going to choose your first, your first favorite, second, third, fourth, by whatever metric you believe. You know, we've had seen a lot today, from the tables and the demonstrations to your interactions, informally to the presentations. You can choose uh, your top four, and this is Eurovision style. So, uh, you know, um, basically what will happen is your first place team will receive four points, second place will receive three points, third place will receive uh, two points, and fourth will receive one. Uh, and then the rest will pretend it's like Great Britain or Germany or if you watch Eurovision, you know what I'm talking about, or Croatia or something like that. Um, so we're going to give you a few minutes to vote, we're going to put on some music. Uh, we'll give you a one minute warning before we close the polls, and we're going to do some novices tied checks for fun. I think this also last call of the bar at the same time. Oh, so we got to vote, vote, and uh, the already closed. We get one last drink, and there's an incredible amount of cookies available. Woo. And brownies, but those might be for after. So vote!